for an opportunity to talk to you guys, people in the industry. Um, 25 years, John mentioned, 25 years ago, I think, was roughly when the New South Wales Department, which whatever name it was then, speaking of change, uh, hosted a conference to talk about risk assessment. I think it was about 20, maybe 23 years ago. And I can't even remember where it was, but I remember there was people from the nuclear industry and the chemical industry, and we were all in a room talking about this risk assessment thing. And boy, there's been a, a lot of change uh, since then, and I could walk you through, because I've been lucky enough to be around it, the kind of changes that have, that have happened in how we manage risk. And I would say at the onset that we probably do it better than anybody else in the world as a mining industry, and you should be quite proud of that. And there's a lot of reasons for that that include a, a bumpy journey at times. But in this presentation, I'm going to talk about one particular change. But, but before I start the presentation, I just want to say how great Peter's presentation was. I mean, you go to conferences, and you, you uh, mining conferences, and you hear people talk about unwanted events. But when you're in the risk management business, you hear them talk about the, the different ways. I was at a SEGO presentation in Washington shortly after the event. It was a conference on SEGO. And as Peter was saying, almost everything that was said was about rescue chambers. And I couldn't believe it. There was no real discussion about how do we prevent this happening again. It was rescue chamber salesmen talking about how to put a box underground you could hide in when you needed to. And it was, it was stunning to me as a guy who really grew up in the Australian coal industry with risk management. There was no focus on that. There was a commission after SAGO that was chaired by some quite, quite knowledgeable people, chaired and included. It was a tripartite commission uh, in, in the United States that was after the investigation, Peter. And the number one recommendation was risk management. The other 99 pages, 99% of the report was uh, rescue chambers, communication systems, training of rescue people, you know, uh, all the paranoia of don't communicate, you know, during a rescue to the press, all that sort of stuff that happened in Sago. It was, it was just a waste. We, we are so different here in the way we think than, than the United States. Now, why, why I really like Peter's presentation. Sorry, Peter, I'm going to pick on you a bit. I've watched guys do presentations in the sensory for 25 years, and one of the biggest changes is the way we think. That's, that's what we're trying to do with risk management. We're trying to think differently. We're trying to think proactively, but we're trying to think differently. Peter talked, used words like energy. It's really about managing the energy. We've got to understand the hazard. The hazard is lightning. Let's understand it. It has a high degree of uncertainty. It has a certain probability. See, Peter picked up some data. There's the probabilities of lightning strikes where you are in Australia. You can actually treat it like you do if you're in northern Queensland with rainfall, the one in 100 year event. That's a probability. That's a risk. That's a measure of risk. And he also talked about controls. Those are the things that you do if you have an unacceptable risk related to a certain hazard. And that kind of conversation is, you know, what I. You know, what I like to think uh, has happened in the coal mining industry especially, but also in the hybrid industry in the East Coast and, and, and uh, sorry, to a less degree in the West Coast, uh, in the in mining industry related to risk management. So my presentation, which I'm going to do, try to do uh, fairly quickly, is, a, is about a change. And it's a change that a, I could fit nicely into the information that Peter talked about, which is changing the way, now that we have a hazard that we, we think might be relevant, lightning might be relevant, that we want to look at that hazard related to our particular pit. Now, on the slide it says rack to bow tie. Now rack is a risk assessment method. It's a way of helping you think proactively and systematically. Bow tie is another method of helping you think systematically about an unwanted event. They are two different tools, like the screwdriver and the hammer. They're different tools. We have been doing rack. I did a presentation on rack 25 years ago. I wrote the manual in 1994. It's time to change. It's time to not throw it away. It's still useful, but recognize it has limitations. Now, I've talked about this for a lot of years, so I'm hoping that, uh, that I don't have to talk about it anymore. <laughs> That's a rack, 1994. That's what the manual says. Now, you all have 
versions of that sort of multi-column form that you use for various purposes. I've seen piles of them as after fatalities that have been filled out at mines in a week. You know, you, this, it's really kind of overdone, I think, really. But RAC was designed to help us in the early 90s, 20 years ago, because our accidents said that we weren't thinking about the work that we do, we're doing very, very step by step, very process wise. Where does it start? Where is it finished? So we developed a technique to walk us through those steps and to help us understand what might go wrong. Now, push this hard, eh? There we go. Whoop, too hard. That's where this monster also fits in. This is the 5x5. Five five. This is also something that was introduced as a part of RAC. Uh, I call it a monster because it's, uh, I've also called it kind of a, an epidemic. It's kind of a disease. It's overused again, it's over relied on, but it is useful to give you the big issues. It's not useful to tell you whether the risk is acceptable. Lightning is a hazard to my mind. Isn't an acceptable risk what I do now to try and control that? It won't give you that answer. It won't give you that answer. That's the problem with the rack technique. It helps you think, but it doesn't give you the answers we need today, which is more about are we doing enough? Rack is designed, that's not a form, that's what rack is designed to do. It is designed to help you break down process. What it tries to do, rack does, is break down the thing you're looking at into steps. So you can look step by step, and also to help you look at hazards and energies as you walk through each step. Now let me, let me use the lightning problem because lightning isn't a part of your process. Lightning is something that can affect your business all over the place. It doesn't lend itself to a rack because how are you going to think about what lightning could do to your business by doing that? I mean without looking at the entire process of mining. The hazard is lightning but how do I look at it within the process? So it, it stymies you a bit there. You can do it, you can brainstorm it, but it's not going to be systematic. Rack was not designed for that. Rack was not designed to be used by a supervisor either. That's another presentation. But this is the sort of thing we do with that rack form. You can see on the, in this it's got that 5x5 five five in the corner and it's broken down a bunch of activities. I don't have time to go into this in detail, but basically on the right side it re-ranks risk. Wasn't designed to do that either. Because by re-ranking you're inferring that that 5x5 five five can actually tell you whether risk is acceptable. I get into screaming fights with a lot of safety officers over this, but this does not work. Right? And the guys know that it doesn't work, and so the name of the game is get it in the green. Right? So I can go to work. So you're not getting good thinking out of your supervising the crew. You know, electrical supervising crew about to do some electrical maintenance work. They fill out the form to get the form filled out so they can get to work. And you get a pile of paper in your office or somebody else's office at the mine which says that you did it, but it didn't really change significantly perhaps their thinking. Not as much as you'd like anyway. So, time to move on. You know, rack is good. Rack can, for certain purposes, if you're looking at a process, like this is an example of looking at, at underground belt, and you're trying to figure out where fires might start in an underground belt for certain reasons, the belt structure provides a process you can walk through. The hazards are the heat sources and the, and the combustible materials or gas, and you can, you can find events. It will do that, and it will help you risk rank. It's an example from a, from a North American mine, actually. A bunch of reds that they have because they have a couple of special places underground where they've got some tight spots and some overcasts or undercasts that are, that are dangerous. So they basically have found the reds. Rack can help you do that. It can find the big issues. It can make you look across the mine and maybe if you're looking across the mine in general, you find, hey, lightning may actually be an issue for our mine. Rack can help you find the issue, but it can't help you take it further than just finding it. Rack can help you find things that you maybe you can put together as a type of problem in the mine from a bunch of events that comes out of your rack. Like we may have a problem with a contact with electricity in the long wall isolation and maintenance or down the bottom, a fire in the underground conveyor. They're types of events. Rack can help you find those, but it cannot tell you that what you're doing to control those is leading to having an acceptable risk. That's the limitation in rack. And we're ready to be asking questions about acceptable risk now. So, acceptable risk, what is it? A lot of you have seen the Jim Reason Swiss cheese model, I suppose, in your educational career, Jim Reason stuff. The idea is what we do to try and make sure the risk is acceptable is we put in 
enough controls in terms of the person's competency, in terms of procedures, in terms of design. We have a lot of different things we do to make sure that when the guy goes to do the high voltage maintenance work, that the risk is acceptable. We have a lot of them. We easily have 15, 20 controls sometimes. They all have holes in them. None of them are 100% reliable, and you know from the, talking about the hierarchy control that some controls have more holes than others. Procedures are weaker than design. We all know that now. But how do we decide when we have enough pieces of cheese? And lightning is a great example. I think Peter's done a great job giving an image of a hazard that may be relevant to your mind. He's even giving you contacts. If you want to understand it better, you can call up and understand it. Get those experts to help you understand that problem. But do you do what is adequate to control lightning if it is relevant at your mind? This is the technique that would help you do that. This is the technique you could use for lightning or any sort of generic, if you're in a surface mine, it could be light vehicle, uh, heavy vehicle interaction problems, where you have a single high potential risk event or set of events. This is a tool that can help you do that. Now it's called bow tie because it's represented graphically like this, like a bow tie. The idea is that you're looking at an initiating event. And that initiating event could be a fire starting on a conveyor. Or it could be a lightning strike in proximity to the mine where the energy begins to get out of control. The left side is, if you have a team of people, same sort of teams you have for your racks, good experts or, or individuals that know the work and know the hazard. You think about all the causes. What would be all the causes of this unwanted event that lightning gets into our mind in a way that it might cause an unwanted event? You think of all of those causes. There could be that drilling structure, or that drill drain structure over there. There could be that electrical contact, an electrical circuit that comes down through there. There could be the mesh conveying it through. You're thinking of all this causation. Once you think of all that causation, then you think about for each one of those causes, how do we control them? How do we control the lightning affecting us this way, lightning affecting us that way? Remember, you only do this for something you really want to question your controls about. You don't do this for everything. The things that are most important to the safety of your mind. So you think of all the causes, you brainstorm with the people who know all the controls that you have so that you get an image of the controls that you have. You get an image of those pieces of cheese Swiss cheese that keep that event, that cause, from leading to the unwanted event. Then you go to the right side and you think of, if we did get a lightning strike that got into the mine in some way, what could be the consequences? And there might be a lot of different consequences. So there might be consequences to people, of course, safety, but there might also be consequences to asset, assets. You might have some critical exposure to, to assets that, if they're damaged, cause you a huge amount of problem from lightning. So you look at all the causation, all the consequences on the right side. And of course, then you say, what do we do now? They're called recovery message, uh, measures, but what are the controls that keep the lightning, once it gets into the mine, from causing the big unwanted consequences? So you get a real image, and you can do this graphically, you can buy software to do this, that will actually print it out in a graphic way, you, actually, you can look at this. You can bring the crew or people that are involved in the hazard together to, to review it and decide, are those controls that we put up there adequate for every cause? You might find you don't have any, cause, any controls for some causes or some consequences. And that's what the tool is trying to do, make sure that you have adequate control. Well, these are what the forms look like. It's, it's obvious that it, you don't do it like a bow tie, you make a bow tie out of it, but the idea is you list out causes. This is the causes for a fire starting. You've got four different examples there. I haven't put in the control measures, but this is the actual work that was done at a, at a mine in, um, near, Pens near uh, Pittsburgh in Pennsylvania, just to demonstrate this to the, to the Americans. Then, of course, you look at the consequences, you know, major damage, ventilation, disruption, loss of life. This is all from the control from the idea that we have a fire in a section or main belt. And then you list out all the recovery measures and you come up with new ideas if you're not happy with the profile of controls you have there. It's still a subjective discussion of controls, but at least you're getting them all out onto the table. Now, a lot of companies have taken this further and actually tried to quantify the effectiveness of their controls. And this is a, an area I think it's fair to say is in development in the minds of the risk management experts in the mining industry, wherever they are around the world. That may look like your risk matrices, but that's not. That's control effectiveness matrices. You can see on the 
vertical axis on the left side, elimination of hazard down to awareness, that's the same as the hierarchy of control. So some controls are better than others. But across the top is when you ask the guys, you know these uh, fire suppression heads that are in this, this, this room? Should there be a fire in this room that would douse us in water? How often do you maintain those? How often do you check them? Oh, we've never checked them. How old are they? Oh, about 10 years. How do you know they're going to work? You can't say it's 100%. Now, if you talk about a procedure to a bunch of people, like how often before we do this high voltage switch gear do we actually follow this procedure before we do the task? And the boss says, oh, all the time. And the guy who does it says, well, I don't actually follow it all the time. You know, I mean, sometimes you're in a big rush, boss, and so I, you know, I don't do it that often. So it's actually, you know, 50-50 chance I'm going to do it. You're really capturing how reliable your controls are by having the people who actually know the controls tell you honestly that there's a control. We actually do have a very good engineering control, which is green, but we don't maintain it. We've never checked it. So it actually is an unreliable good control, which makes it not a good control, but a good one to improve. In fact, there's more detail on this chart. Uh, this comes from uh, one of the companies in, in, uh, in New South Wales. Maybe you've seen it before. In their chart, they give examples and they give descriptions, but they're trying to help people take the bow tie and then talk about the degree to which each control is effective. If you do that, you can get the controls. Once you, this is, this is back to the American study, again, with uh, one of the causes is rubbing a belt. All kinds of controls there. You can see if you just look at the colors on the right, there's not very many that are green. There's only one green one. But there is, clearly, the ones that are in the red boxes. One is one you want to make sure happens, the design of the conveyor so the structure doesn't rub. But the other three are good controls that are engineering controls that are not reliable because we're not managing them very well. So the first thing to improve is to make your good controls work, not to put in new controls. That's the kind of discussion that you have. Finding your unreliable good controls is the first thing you improve, and you may even be able to say that those are now your critical controls, which a lot of companies are then putting in their risk register and saying, if there's anything we want to control right down the ground fire, is we want that fire detection system to be reliable. Joe, that's your system, you own it, it'll be monitored and checked and inspected every X amount of time, and therefore it becomes a critical control for this mine. We manage it with a, a higher degree of vigor than we do the other controls. So it starts to move you in a different direction, up the journey, through the change of managing risk better, as we do all the time. Uh, this is again is from a corporate uh, company, Centennial actually, who put this sort of thing together in their actual uh, software system they worked with a supplier on so that you have a, a combination there. I know you can't read that, but that's rack. If we take a bit of it out, you can see in there fire on the conveyor has caused by and resulting in. It has the same sort of information in a bow tie. If you switch it around a bit, you've got a bow tie, but they've actually linked this approach to understanding causation and consequence to look at controls into a resource that is available to you if you work in the coal industry called RiskGate. Uh, where the preventative controls and the mitigating controls are fed into this or linked into it from RiskGate. So RiskGate is something that Lionel's going to talk about after coffee, so I'm not going to talk about it anymore. He's going to give you a good presentation on RiskGate in relation to the electrical environment that you work in. But it's a tool that will provide controls to you about an unwanted event in the red circle in the middle, the causes, the preventative controls to reduce those causes, the consequences, and the controls to reduce the likelihood that the consequences will be unacceptable. So a lot of change happening. And for a guy like me who's been doing this for 25 years, the change now is we're starting to move away from just using rack to much more systematic looks at our controls where the risk is unacceptable. I think we can redefine what risk, how you calculate risk. I don't, I don't suggest you, go, you totally throw away the idea that risk is a combination of the likelihood of an event and the consequences. Don't, don't throw that away. But really, if you want to think about it in practical terms, if you're an electrical engineer or a person who's responsible for electrical safety at your, at your mine and the safety of people working in the electrical system, the risk that your people are exposed to is a degree to which it's not under control. If you know your controls and you know they're effective, you should be comfortable. If you know your controls but you don't know they're effective, 
you've got an issue. If you don't know your controls, you're crossing your fingers. Rack will not help you understand the controls. Getting hold of the control thing is the next phase in risk management. So I highly recommend to you, if you know, don't know of the bow tie process, and a lot of you do, and I know a lot of you are involved in it. If you don't know about bow tie, investigate it. There's a lot of good information around on it. It's, it's a very easy technique to facilitate. You don't get into the argument about is it a three or is it an A or is it a B, which is, drives a lot of our discussion in Iraq. It's just very straightforward. What are the causes? How do we control them? What are the consequences? How do we control them? It creates a great graphic model. You know, it's a potentially easy and effective tool to use to move us up the journey to help us manage the changes that we make in the way we manage risk in the Australian mining industry, which again is something you should be quite proud of. Thank you very much.